Welcome, everybody. It's already the last day of NDC London, unfortunately. It's a real pity because it went so fast, but it's always the same when uh, things are entertaining and uh, always uh, fun. I hope you got some coffee or tea or even a beer because uh, we will cover quite some topics in this session. We will talk about offline web apps or actually how to make them disappear because it uh, wouldn't be great if we could access any website and even when we are offline, still we can access this uh, website and uh, interact with it and it would still work without any problem. This is already possible nowadays uh, and uh, with a little effort thanks to progressive web apps or I will more often call in this session PWAs in short. We will see from a general level what uh, are progressive web apps and all the benefits that they can offer. And then we progressively go deeper and deeper into more technical details. And uh, at the end, uh, we will uh, see how it's possible with uh, PWAs and border technologies to build apps that are never offline. So I always ask uh, the same uh, uh, questions before uh, talking about progressive web apps uh, in. Uh, um, let me. Doesn't scale well. Okay. Before my talks, and indeed, uh, this I'm very happy. There is one person that works mainly with the PWAs because usually, and that's a, it's a real pity for PWAs, uh, people heard about it, but they didn't really try it or they didn't really play with it uh, in, a, in a personal project or in real life in a productive environment. And that's a pity because uh, we don't have to think about progressive web apps as a whole block of uh, functionalities that we have to take uh, in a whole. We can just uh, take some of these uh, functionalities, features, and then adapt uh, to our application according to what uh, we need. So we can, uh, uh, this is the progressive part of PWA, we can progressively enhance our application with more and more uh, uh, functionalities according to what we need. But let's say, let's start. Before going on, just a couple of words about me. My name is Francesco Leardini, and I work as a senior consultant and Angular trainer at Trivadis, an IT company providing consulting and training services uh, over a wide set of technologies with headquarters in Zurich, Switzerland. However, as you might have already guessed from my hand movements and probably from my accent, I'm originally from Italy, from a lovely city in front of the Adria Sea in the north. Even though I work uh, as a full stack engineer, have, having uh, C Sharp and uh, .NET as my backend side, I love uh, web technology, specifically PWAs and browser APIs. And I'm lucky to be able to share my interests and findings, uh, talking at conferences or writing blog posts on uh, Dev Portal. But enough about me. Let's start our PWA journey with a typical case. Let's imagine we are commuting to work or well, when we are still used to do it at least. And uh, here, for example, we might be on the central line. I can see next stop is bank. So we are just uh, traveling, commuting to work or whatever, whatever. But our connectivity is maybe flaky, unstable. And this is often the case when we are on a subway or simply traveling uh, on the train, for example. So we are reading some posts on our favorite tech block and then bam. This is what we often experience, indeed not the best user experience. And it seems it didn't change much in time. However, nowadays, thanks to progressive web apps, we can provide a much better user experience. We can easily provide at least a customized offline page, eventually with some useful information about our web application. We can promote, for example, some items that are on sale if we are an e-commerce company. In other cases, we can bring this uh, offline page to even a further step. We can provide, for example, an offline game like Trivago did or is doing with a uh, labyrinth game. So in order to keep uh, the user attention locked into the web app until the connectivity eventually will be shortly restored. This, if you think about, is really a cool trick because uh, with this, we can retain a potential customer that otherwise would have been lost. We see the offline page, we lose immediately interest, interest, and we close the app. 
But all this is possible with uh, progressive bugs, and we will see actually much more. Let's see now a small test. Uh, Progressive apps, first of all, can be installed on a user device and we can define their layout, like uh, the name that will be displayed, the icon that will be used and how the browser will render them by configuring a specific JSON file called web manifest that we will describe later on. But it's important to, to understand is that one goal of PWAs is uh, to be able to provide a native app experience to our users. So, here is a screenshot of my phone, where is an Android phone, where I installed the native app and the progressive web app of uh, Twitter. If we open it, we can see that the two, the layout of the two applications look indeed the very similar ones installed on the user device. Now I will give you just a few seconds in order to try to guess which one is the Android native app and which one is the PWA. Indeed, uh, it's, a, it's a tough call because except in the header, few details and colors, the main layout is exactly pixel perfect equal. So it's very difficult to understand which one is the native app and which one is the PWA. I will give you now so, a very subtle, let's go, let's go like this, hint. This is the memory that is uh, used by the application on my phone. And the, Probably now you understood which one is the native app and which one is the progressive web app. And indeed, it's a very interesting to see how, how, how small memory footprint as a progressive web app compared to a native app. So indeed, who guessed that on the right side is the PWA and on the left side is the native app? It was right. Congratulations. Let's move now to see and analyze which one are the core components uh, that are behind progressive web apps. The first one we will uh, analyze and describe is the web manifest. Web manifest is a JSON file that defines how our progressive web app will be rendered once installed on the user device. Here uh, displayed, we can, have, we can see all the uh, mandatory fields needed to show the so-called add to home screen dialog once the, the user access uh, our PWA with uh, the phone for the first time. Then once uh, clicking uh, this uh, dialog or this banner, then the browser will, will download and install our PWA on the user device. Of course, a service worker must also be installed and running in order to be able to display such a banner. So this uh, would look like our application once installed, and uh, we can see that we can define a name and a short name Short name is optional, but is a is good to have it because it's a fallback in case that the name is too long. Because of this, it's a best practice to not use a short name longer than sixteen characters. More important is the display property that has different values. Browser is the default value that we can get when we access with our phone any kind of website. So not really interesting. Standalone is much more interesting because it not only opens our PWA in a completely standalone independent uh, tab of, uh, of the applications on uh, the phone, but we can see also that it removes some UI element of the browser. We don't have any more, for example, the uh, URL bar. And lastly, the full screen value, as the name suggests, is uh, taking the whole screen device, the, the full screen of the device, and is more suited for uh, games or uh, web apps that are rich in media content. We can define a start URL, and this also helps uh, to uh, increase the user engagement, because, for example, we don't want that uh, every time the user opens our PWA, maybe the late last visited page will be open. By defining a start URL, we always will open the same page that usually is the home or is the dashboard, exactly as it happened with the native app. We have to define here a, a relative path to one of the pages of our PWA. Plus we can define other uh, properties uh, that are not mandatory. For example, the display mode, so we can the um, orientation mode, if we want in a portrait or horizontal, so in a landscape mode, but it's not required for the uh, banner. Important are icons. We can define a set of different icons uh, sizes. As a minimum, we should provide 192 and 512. 
then the browser will scale accordingly to the, the screen device that the user will use. However, it's always good to have a multiple sizes in order to be able to target pixel perfect our uh, devices of our users. So, if we define all these uh, properties in a good way and the service worker is running, once we access our PWA, we will see at the bottom of the screen, indeed, that is a add the to home screen dialog. By clicking on it, simply will be installed on the desktop. However, we don't have to remember by heart all these properties. There are a lot of uh, manifest generators that we can use in order to uh, very easily to create uh, this JSON file and then simply upload it to our uh, site. There are some uh, negative uh, notes or negative news for Apple devices. Progressive web apps, still work uh, quite good in uh, on uh, iOS devices, but not all the features are supported. For example, uh, uh, push notifications cannot be used. We have uh, a limit of just uh, 50 megabytes uh, for the cache, even though 50 megabytes could be already enough for many cases. And uh, some of the properties of the web manifest are not really supported. Therefore, out of the box, uh, there would not be really the possibility to have uh, icons on the home screen using just uh, the web manifest. However, thanks for us, uh, there are some libraries we can use uh, to overcome this limitation. One of these uh, is a Google library called the PWA Compact that allows us uh, to automatically extract some uh, or read uh, the manifest.json entries and create for us some um, tags in the index.html in order to overcome the lack of support on iOS devices. So this is a quite convenient library because it allows us to target also uh, iOS devices for our PWAs and uh, save us a lot of uh, manual work of copy paste or create uh, these tags manually on the index.html. Aside of these uh, core properties that we just saw in the uh, manifest file, we can also add the so-called shortcuts always in the web manifest file. When a user engages with our apps icon once it's installed, so right-click on the mouse on a desktop or in case of a, a mobile device, so a long press, then the user agent can use these uh, shortcut values to display a context according to the used OS. And we can see that, in short, a shortcut is just a link to an URL pointing to any page of our Progress Web App. Usually, we use shortcuts to refer to uh, common actions, in this case of Twitter, for example, composing a new tweet, or some important pages, for example, a notification a dashboard. These shortcuts help to increase user engagement and to be much more friendly providing a richer experience that usually is not possible with just plain web applications. We have to keep in mind though that shortcuts are not yet fully supported. They are available only on Android and Windows uh, based on Chromium uh, browsers. So hopefully in the future, the support will be expanded also to other browser and uh, OS. Let's see now another very important uh, component of Progress Web Apps, the service worker. A service worker is a JavaScript file similar to a web worker, but uh, differently from this, differently from the web worker that uh, usually has just a generic task of offloading the workload from the main thread, the service worker has a specific uh, task of acting as a proxy between uh, the client app and the server. So stays in the middle and intercept all the traffic from and to our application. It runs uh, on a separate thread, and because of this, uh, it's called non-blocking. And this is a good news, because uh, if the service worker crashes for any reason, we don't want that also our web app would be affected anyway by this. And also, this allows uh, to let the service worker keep running even when the user leaves our app or close the, uh, the browser, for example. Service worker works only on uh, secure connections, so HTTPS, or localhost that is considered for uh, development purposes secure. But let's see how does it work, how it gets installed. So the first time we access our website, then we download, the, we get the response, and we download also the service worker file. 
that gets installed on the uh, client side. And according to how we implemented the, the service worker, we might eventually already start caching locally some assets. From that moment on, the following uh, requests will be intercepted by a service worker and the service worker will provide, if available, the response from the cache, meaning that we don't even need to go over the network. This has uh, two benefits. On one side, the response will be extremely quick because uh, we have already the needed data locally in the cache. And as on the other side, we don't need to go over the network. Therefore, our application will still continue working and displaying, providing data, even when the user is offline. Everything starts with the registration of the service worker. And if this step is successfully, allows to, pro to proceed with the service worker installation and activation steps. When we register a service worker, so we need to pay attention to its location. This at the beginning, it's uh, always a cause of some uh, confusions, a problem when we start working with progressive web apps. Typically, the service worker file, physical file, is placed at the root of the domain. This allows the service worker scope to cover the entire origin and allow to receive fetch events from everything under its domain. The scope parameter that we can see in the snippet is optional. We can use it to specify if we specify a subset of our content that we want the service worker to cover if needed. Otherwise, as usual is the case, if omitted, the uh, default scope of the service worker will be its own location. Let's see now a first demo showing uh, how we can uh, create in a very easy way a custom offline page. We can see here is a very, very simple uh, demo and on purpose I kept uh, so simple because I didn't want uh, to have any kind of uh, framework, a uh, boilerplate, but focus only on the bare logic needed uh, to create and to provide an offline page. The goal is uh, to show that actually there is no excuse nowadays uh, to not have at least a custom offline page as a one or as a minimum feature provided and used for in our uh, progressive web apps. So we have uh, a just normal plain index.html with uh, some static file and uh, we register our manifest file and uh, we register a main JS, uh, JavaScript file. Main JavaScript file, nothing does except uh, uh, registering our service worker file and that's it. More important is what we can do with the service worker file. So in here we have uh, uh, the skeleton of the different steps of a service worker. In the install phase, install step, we can usually uh, create or instruct the service worker about uh, uh, prefetching some assets. Usually here we wanted to, not this, we wanted to prefetch all the static assets that compose the app shell and then will be provided what immediately once the service worker is installed. So we see here some static files like style files, images, and the URL of our uh, offline page. That is a simple uh, HTML page with some static content, nothing fancy, nothing more. In the activate uh, uh, phase, we can eventually clean up all the caches if we want, but for the sake of the demo, this is not relevant. What is more important is in the fetch event where we can intercept all the calls that are uh, emitted or are requested by our application. And here, for example, we can see, okay, whenever there is a, a navigation, meaning that we are requesting a, 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 to navigate to a different page, we can see whether this fetch method fails or not. If it fails, it's quite likely that we are offline and therefore it's safe to provide a, an offline page. Otherwise, we provide the requested data. Here we can already see a preview or, of uh, what we will discuss uh, later, but we can see the implementation of the cache first strategy. This strategy means that uh, we go first and check, uh, check in the uh, cache and see if the data is uh, there available. And if so, we provide this trade. 
Otherwise, we fall back to a normal um, network call. The match is a method of the cache API. It's an interface that is used by the service worker. And it's uh, quite powerful. But let's see now how does it work. So this is our extremely complex demo. We are online, and now if we open the network tab, actually the application tab on the service worker menu, we can see that we have our service worker up and running. If we open the cache storage, we can see that all the static files that we defined in the prefetch step are here already locally and cached. Now, if I turn offline, so let me, yeah, if I turn offline and I refresh the page, I have a nice or decent, let's say, a nice uh, offline page, and I can provide some uh, static uh, content. Here, for example, if uh, I would have uh, my blog, for example, and the user access it while offline, still I can provide some meaningful content, maybe some interesting facts about uh, uh, my blogs or my uh, work or just PWAs. If uh, now I, for example, I delete the service worker, and I refresh the page while offline. So this would be otherwise what the user would get. And you can indeed very easily see that the experience is not one of the best. So with this demo, I wanted to show you how easy is that to create an offline page and how powerful can be to provide a, a nice fallback, a nice uh, offline page for our users. Let's see how we can speed up, how can, how can we boost the response time of our web apps? It's important to introduce the caching strategies as a concept. This is also very crucial in PWAs. It's important because a service worker doesn't know by default what to cache. We need to implement these caching strategies in our service worker in order to define which assets or network calls we want to cache. There are different uh, strategies we, that we can implement, and uh, some of them best fit a specific scenario, while other are more suited for other kind of uh, usage. This is important because uh, in the past years uh, we saw a trend that the mobile access is increasing, and in 2019 actually overcome took over the desktop uh, assets. Therefore, it's crucial being able to optimize our web applications for mobile devices. No excuses anymore. The first strategy is called cache first. We already briefly saw it before. We use this strategy when we want to ensure that the response time is blazing fast, or when we want to provide some contents even when the user is offline. When implemented this strategy, what the service worker does is first go over the net, over the cache and try to provide there the assets if available. And if not, it fall back to a normal network call. On the opposite side, there is the network first strategy. This is more suited for resources that are updated very frequently and we want to show always the very latest value. For example, we are providing the values of a stock exchange market and that indeed is crucial to display the very latest, the very up-to-date value of the shares. In this case, the service worker does exactly the opposite thing as we saw before. So first we go over the network and then if there is no connectivity or if we define a timeout and this timeout expires, then the service worker falls back on the cache and tries to provide the data from there. In case we implemented this uh, strategy, so it's uh, good uh, to keep in mind that if it's uh, crucial to provide uh, the very latest uh, uh, version of the data, that the users that are offline will get uh, an older version because we provide this uh, from the cache. Therefore, it's good uh, maybe to notify them, uh, uh, A, you are offline or the data that you are getting is a stale version, especially indeed if our domain wanted to use the very latest data. Stale validate strategy is a very interesting one. It uses a kind of a combination of the previous two strategies and brings the benefit of both. On one side, when we fetch a request, the service worker immediately go over the cache and tries to provide from there the response. Therefore, we benefit from a very, very quick response. 
But in the background, also the service worker goes over the network and fetches a new version of the data and updates the cached one. Therefore, next call, the service worker will go over the cache, but he will find already an updated version. Therefore, we can provide a very quick response and with newer data. To implement this strategy, we need a little bit more code. It's not overly complicated, but yeah, we have to work a little bit more. But uh, it's uh, good to know that uh, nowadays we can use a lot of uh, um, libraries that uh, can uh, take over a little bit of the complexity of uh, caching strategies and uh, all this uh, complexity that uh, we have to implement. And uh, let us uh, focus only on uh, the business logic, as it should be, actually. One of these uh, libraries is called uh, Workbox, is an open source project from Google. It consists in a set, actually, in a set of libraries and node modules that make it easy to cache assets and implement caching strategies. Not only the previous one we saw, but even more. It works by registering routes. We can register routes by defining uh, strings that uh, uh, target a specific file path or regular expressions, like in this case, where we wanted to cache a JavaScript file and CSS files. But the, the good news come now that we can just invoke uh, one method, in this case, the stay while revalidate method, and that's it. This is all what we need to do in order to implement all the code that we saw before. And uh, to be sure that uh, the, uh, the implementation of these strategies is indeed uh, very well optimized. Another possible uh, library or, or tool we can use is called the PWA Builder is an open source project from Microsoft that allows to create a manifest file and implement, even though to a relatively easy extent, a service worker and some caching strategies. One nice thing of the PWA Builder is that we can very easily create a TWA, means a trust web application, that allow us to wrap our progressive web app in a APK and make it very easily uh, or allow us very easily this way to install our PWA on the Play Store. So without us having to compile and create the API key, APK. While uh, the uh, Workbox is a completely framework agnostic, therefore we can use in uh, application Angular projects or vanilla projects, there are of course uh, each framework providing their own uh, custom solution. And Angular is uh, also providing, uh, thanks to Angular PWA schematic, a very easy way to turn an existing uh, Angular project into a full working uh, uh, Angular PWA project. When we invoke uh, this uh, command in the terminal for our uh, project, then the um, the, uh, the, the CLI downloads all the needed uh, modules, creates uh, some files and downloads some assets and sets up everything for us with some default values. Of course, in a production environment, we have to customize them and we can, and we will see how we can also eventually extend this. But uh, uh, actually in, for some very simple cases, this could be already enough. So let's see now a very basic uh, Angular PWA application. The goal of this uh, demo, and I will in any case uh, write the uh, URL uh, later on also in Slack, the demo wants uh, to show how easily you can turn an existing Angular project in, in a full working uh, PWA. So let's switch to it. Okay. So, this is a very simple Angular project I already created for the sake of saving time, and I already run this command. As we can see in the uh, app modules, we have a service worker module already uh, downloaded, and here we registered a servi uh, Angular service worker file. This is the real physical service worker file that uh, Angular creates for us. However, it's good to know that we cannot manually touch this file or actually we could, but it's not suggested to do so. Because this file is uh, uh, not in our project, uh, but is inside the node modules folder. So if we would like manually to change it, then every time we make a, a, a production build, 
this file would be overridden. So all our changes would be lost. And this is still nowadays a limitation of Angular framework in terms of working and uh, working with the PWAs and providing uh, ways of uh, customize the service work. One possible uh, solution to this is to create a custom root uh, service worker that uh, imports the Angular service worker file and another custom service worker file where we can implement all our logic. And then we register here our root service worker file. It's possible, so it's not exactly uh, straightforward. It's a kind of a workaround still. Hopefully in the future, they will uh, allow to, uh, to interact straight with the service work. Among the other things that this command that is a schematic does is a creating with the default values a manifest file. We can see uh, here we have a new uh, properties that we didn't saw before. For example, a thin color and the background color that will be used as a banner or as a background for the splash screen when the PWA opens and a set of icons that are already created for us. What is more interesting is the Angular Service Worker configuration file. These uh, values are created by default when we execute this command and allows to uh, cache static assets. We can see that in a, inside the asset group, we have uh, two uh, objects, one with the install mode prefetch. This means uh, to fetch during the um, install phase, uh, all these files, exactly as we saw before. So while this, the service worker is installing, it will already prefetch all these files. If we use uh, an install mode with value lazy, that means that uh, for us, uh, these uh, uh, assets or these files, in this case, uh, font files and maybe some images are not so important. Therefore, the service worker will uh, uh, cache them only after they have been requested at least once. And then we can define update mode prefetch, meaning that, uh, or we tell the service worker, hey, look, we want that as soon as you detect that there is a newer version of this cached uh, resource, then you eagerly download it and up updates it on the, in the cache. This is what the update mode prefetch does. So this is created everything uh, uh, with just the single command. We didn't have to do anything. And this is to cache only uh, static assets, but uh, we could uh, do something more. We can also create a uh, data groups where we can specify URLs that we want the service worker to cache. So to cache the uh, get and the, the, the request and the response. In here, and this is another yeah, light limitation of, of uh, Angular, it's possible to define only two strategies. Angular calls the cache first strategy performance and the network first freshness. But these two, are exactly the first two uh, st caching strategies we saw. So we can define a URL and uh, we can define which strategy we want to use. And then of course, it's uh, relatively straightforward. We can see for how long we want to retain in cache and how many entries we want. Here, we can see that for the freshness strategy, we can even define a timeout here in this case of five seconds, meaning that if the call gets uh, more than five seconds to get the request, the response, it's already quite a, a, a huge amount, then the service worker will fall back to the uh, cache. But let's see now, how does it look like? So this is uh, the uh, demo. We can see we have two cards. One uh, is uh, showing, uh, let me refresh it. One is uh, showing uh, always uh, uh, the latest joke from a dead joke uh, website. We are not interested to get the very latest uh, value. Therefore, we use the performance or cash first strategy. On the other side, we are crazy for cats. So we want always a new version of it. So a new image. Therefore, every time I refresh the page, we can see that the, the joke comes from the cache. So it remains the same, but we get a new image. Now, if we open the uh, dev tools, we have our service worker installed. If you open the cache storage, we can see here we have plenty of uh, assets cached. But the interesting thing is that if I go over the network tab and I refresh it, we can see that only the dead jokes comes from the server, uh, from the service worker, so from the cache, while the images come from the network. Now, if I go offline, 
So let's imagine I'm uh, traveling, I'm uh, offline, and I refresh the page. We can see that not only all my static assets, so the images are provided, but also the uh, responses that I use uh, to uh, fill the content of these uh, cards are provided, and the response is immediate because they come from the cache. We can see now that uh, even the search does not go over the network, but is provided by the service worker. Another important uh, file that uh, we can see that is uh, every time I refresh the page, I access the page is downloaded, is the um, this uh, JSON file, NGSW, so Angular Service Worker JSON file. It's important because inside of it, there is a Nash table for uh, with values for each of our uh, assets that we cached. And then the service worker will use this table and these values to detect whether there is a newer version of the cache and eventually, according to how we define it, our logic eventually updates uh, in the cache. Another important thing to know is that if uh, we have uh, maybe a bug, a faulty version of our uh, PWA, we can delete this uh, service worker uh, NGSW JSON file and deploy it. So I will delete it, yes. So now, if I refresh the page, let me go here, the service worker is still up and running. If I refresh the page, the uh, application will try to download again this JSON file, but it won't find it because we downloaded it, we deleted it, and this we we'll have as a fault, uh, as a fact that uh, we can see here our uh, service worker is deleted and also the cache is completely wiped. This is a, a good thing to know because uh, it might allow us uh, to maybe uh, be sure that uh, all our users uh, will not have any more uh, maybe a faulty or a buggy version of a service worker. So we just have to get rid of that uh, uh, JSON file in order to be sure to wipe everything from our PWA. Okay, so as we can see with uh, Angular, it's uh, very easy to start with uh, PWAs and in many cases, maybe we don't even have to change much of the uh, proposed commands. As I say, the cache API is used to uh, cache data, but allows it to uh, cache to get, to cache only get calls. This is fine for passive applications where we simply deliver data. But in many cases, we also need to allow the users to edit or create some content. Think about uh, we are traveling and we are filling a very uh, large form. And then we click on submit, but maybe we are offline and then we just get back a message. Yeah, sorry, server not available. Well, not so nice, right? So how we can do better how we can provide a better experience to our users, even with these uh, kind of uh, uh, events, uh, when we want, for example, to retain these uh, post and put uh, verbs or actions. We can go, as a first approach, we can go custom and we can implement our own solution. This is possible thanks to the background sync API in combination with the index DB. What the uh, background sync API does, let us defer some actions until the user has a stable connectivity. So before directly posting our form data to the server, we save the data into the IndexedDB locally. So, and then we register a synchronization, giving it a specific name. At that point, if the network connection is available, so we are online, then the sync happens immediately. So no matter. While if the user is offline, then the sync will be postponed until the connection is restored again. We can keep uh, all these uh, pending uh, uh, changes uh, uh, stored locally in the index DP. And then one online again, we can go through all these pending changes and, uh, sh and fire them in the, in the proper order. The cool thing is that uh, thanks to the service worker, even if uh, the user navigates uh, to another page or even close the tab, uh, with our application, still the uh, synchronization will take place because uh, the uh, service worker runs in the background. This is a cool thing. We have to keep in mind though that unfortunately, background sync API is uh, supporting only at the moment, at least in Chromium-based browsers. However, 
we can provide a fallback uh, um, f approach for our browser that, that don't support the background sync API using online and offline events. Even though they are not as reliable as a service worker, still they are a very good fallback. Again, if we are developers a little bit lazy and we want a, a, an easy life, we can try to use some tools, like for example, Cloud Firestore. Cloud Firestore is a NoSQL database belonging to the Fireplace platform. That is a Google product. They offer a set of cloud services for web and mobile applications. The cool thing of Cloud Firestore is that it provides, in a very simple way, it provides uh, offline persistence. So we downloaded this uh, library in our application. We initialize with uh, some keys that uh, the uh, platform will provide us. And then we just call one single method called uh, enable persistence. From that moment on, all the uh, documents that we fetch from the database, so through uh, Cloud Firestore, will be um, Back to, will be stored locally in the IndexedDB and made available also for offline accesses. This means that while offline, we can still read and even edit those files offline. Then the cool thing is that one, while we then go online again, Cloud Firestore automatically will detect these pending changes and synchronize to the uh, cloud uh, database, uh, all the pending changes for us. We don't have to do absolutely anything. And then all the changes that have been updated on the, on the database will be automatically propagated to all the other listening clients that are connected to our database. This is called three-way bindings and is done thanks to WebSockets. Let's see now our last demo that shows a combination of these technologies that we talked so far. So we have an Angular application that has been announced with Progressive Web Apps, so with a service worker, and uses as a database Cloud Firestore, where we also announced offline persistence. So the, the goal of these demos is also to give an explanation or to justify the title that nowadays with modern technologies, we can provide a much better experience for our users. And actually we have no more excuse to not provide always working application, even when the user is offline. So let me open also the emulator for my phone. Exactly. So before going on, just a couple of words about the domain or what this application does. This is a personal project of mine and is a simple, uh, like let's say, playroom to test uh, things around. And uh, I keep track of all nice uh, bar, restaurants uh, and uh, places uh, that are worth to visit while traveling around. So that uh, if I go back again, I can remember them or actually I can suggest to friends or I can suggest to avoid them if they are not good. This, of course, is a progressive web app. And uh, on the right side, we can see that uh, on my phone is installed and it looks like a, a native app. An interesting thing with uh, Android devices and Chrome is that if we download a progressive web app using an Android device and using Chrome, what uh, Chrome does for us, uh, no, what uh, Chrome does for us is that uh, it goes uh, immediately, it, uh, it creates a special APK and uh, uh, signs it for us. It's called, uh, in this case, uh, it's called uh, mm, web APKs. And then sign it for us and install it for us. So we, thanks to Android and Chrome, we not only just uh, download and install on the home screen our PWA, but the Chrome signs uh, this uh, uh, PWA for us. And you can see here in the bottom, app installed from Google Play Store. So it looks like really my PWA has been uh, installed and uh, it seems that is a native app, even though it is not. And also thanks to this, if uh, we open with uh, a browser, for example, uh, a URL that is within 
the scope of our progressive web app, automatically Android with, uh, uh, with his uh, um, functionalities will open this uh, URL, not in, uh, in the browser, but within our uh, PWA straight. So it's a, it's a very nice uh, functionality and good to know. Okay, so first of all, let's see what is uh, the three-way binding. Uh, let's just take uh, one uh, entry for North Island. It's a very nice uh, craft beer place uh, in the remote North uh, uh, Island of uh, Japan, and I save it. And we can see that uh, these uh, changes is now automatically propagated uh, to my phone. I didn't touch it, so no way of uh, cheating. So this means a three-way binding. When we uh, ship the changes from one client and the changes uh, is uh, saved uh, on the database, then is automatically pushed to all other clients that automatically get uh, this uh, uh, new value and can refresh, thanks to observables, can refresh uh, their page. But now let's see what is really cool. So we have uh, our application and we are traveling. So I simulated that I'm traveling in a very remote area and I switch on the airplane mode. So now I'm completely offline. However, I can refresh my page and my app. And of course, I can still get all the assets and all the content because it is a uh, PWA. I can also open a new uh, document that did I visit, didn't visit before because thanks to the uh, offline persistent of the Cloud Firestore, this document that I fetched, it's already cached locally. Therefore, I can get all its data. Let's uh, change it now and let's write uh, offline just for the sake of uh, uh, demo and I save it. So we can see now that this changes is a change is only on my uh, phone because of course I'm traveling, I'm offline. So there is no way I can push propagate this change. Let me uh, change just another one just for sake of uh, the demo. I save this one too. And now I have uh, two changes, the top one that are only on my phone. The cool things of the combination of these technologies is that uh, you can see that I'm now completely offline, but I can read the data. I can open even completely new other uh, documents. I can change them and still the application works perfectly. There is uh, no idea that I'm offline. Now I switch on the uh, connectivity again and what would you expect is that all these uh, changes that are now pending and are only locally on my phone will be automatically propagated on the left side of the screen so to the other clients it will take some time according to how long it take my phone to reconnect it to the network and uh, uh, that was quite fast so we can see that immediately now the changes has been uh, propagated to the other client so it's really, really nice experience that with these uh, technologies we can provide our users. Plus, it has the benefit that our users absolutely have no perception of being offline or online. Our application just works. Cool. So now we saw a lot of nice things about PWAs. So now Monday, maybe you go back on the office and you tell your, your colleagues, well, you know what? Just to throw all the native apps away and let's just go on with uh, native apps. Well, wait, wait a minute. Of course, PWAs has a lot of nice features and potentiality and they are growing more and more with the years. Still, I don't think PWAs can take over native apps, not yet at least. There are, as we mentioned before, many features that are still not supported by Apple, like web notifications, some web manifest properties. To, to, uh, to mention some. Therefore, if uh, for our business is uh, crucial to target Apple devices, this could be indeed uh, a showstopper. On the other side, PWAs can do only what web applications can do because the PWAs are nothing else than uh, websites with uh, some other fancy functionalities. For example, we cannot uh, access the contact list of the, of the phone. Even though this is not exactly true, because uh, uh, there is a new uh, new uh, API, browser API from Google called the Contact Picker API that allows, after the user grant permission, 
allows uh, to access within the scope of the web application all the uh, list of contacts from the phone. This though is still in a very experimental stage and is available only for Chrome browsers. And lastly, native apps have in general a much better performance because they tie into the underlying pro uh, operative system, while uh, PWAs are provided through browsers. So if we have to create a very um, expensive, let's call it that expensive uh, in terms of resources application for a game, then most probably native app is the good choice. I will, uh, uh, before concluding my talk, I will leave some uh, further resources about PWA so that uh, you can explore further. Some of them are a kind of a gallery that shows uh, all possible examples of uh, PWAs that you can use and you can eventually get some uh, inspiration for your next project while others are uh, successful cases or a list of uh, functionalities that are possible thanks to uh, or within progressive web apps. That's it, I'm finished my talk. I hope uh, you enjoyed it and you find it interesting. Of course, if you have any questions, you can uh, write uh, your question here in the WebEx uh, chat or in the Slack chat, and I will be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, for attending and uh, for your attention.